everyone. Uh, my name is Imad Wani. Uh, I'm the CTO of Lexion. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, before starting Lexion, I was at Microsoft for a little more than eight years, uh, mostly working on machine learning uh, products. I, I was fortunate enough to get to co-found a lot of machine learning products from the V0 at Microsoft, uh, like Bot Framework and uh, AI Scheduling Assistant. And I was one of the very early people to work on Lewis, the language understanding service. Uh, in general, I'm really uh, very passionate about NLP, but more importantly about creating, uh, solving business problems using NLP and, and machine learning in general. Uh, I left Microsoft and joined the AI2 Incubator to, to start something in, in, in the NLP space. And that's why I met my co-founder and uh, we started working uh, on what Lexium became. And I'm very excited to present this to you. Uh, thanks, Alyssa, for the opportunity. And honestly, I couldn't think of somebody better than Diego to come after. Like his talk is like perfect. <laughs> like this is just like great, great sequencing. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into it. Um, I'm going to start with giving a quick overview of, of what Lexion does. So at a very high level, Lexion is basically a software that allows you to run uh, and apply natural language processing to legal agreements. Uh, and really, the technology that we built can be applied to any kind of business document. So we and you even like did a lot of proof of concepts on different domains like insurance, finance, real estate, etc. But our go to market was focusing on legal agreements because there's a lot of demand and clear business value. Uh, and to make this more concrete and what kind of value we bring, a very like simple example, imagine if you're at a company and you're managing, you're in the legal team, you're managing thousands of tens of thousands of agreements, and you want to answer a simple question like, uh, how many of my agreements are active versus expired? And what's kind of like the key next date of like expiry or, or renewal and something that I need to take action on? Be without using technology like Plexion, you, people would have to do this manually. They literally would go document by document, open it, and have to keep track of things like, when does the contract start? What is its term? Does it auto renew? Is it perpetual? How many renewal periods do we have? A lot of small bits of metadata to kind of reach this simple thing. Uh, but with Lexion, this takes minutes instead of months or weeks. And this is one simple example. In reality, there's just so much more rich information in contracts that uh, people who run businesses will have to operationalize things related to indemnity, liability, assignment, and th th it's a very long list. And this is really where Lexion shines. And this is a, a, a harder problem than it seems. Uh, it might kind of like seem like a simple entity extraction problem, but really these contracts are on usually on very messy PDFs. Uh, they're very long documents. So traditional NLP techniques don't, don't translate as well. Like most NLP techniques were built for like either short utterances or like web type documents. These are more like 200 and 300 page documents spread across multiple agreements sometimes. Uh, the lawyers don't really write like the rest of us. They have their own way of very complicated legalese language, which is really hard for humans to decipher, so even harder for machines. Uh, and the kind of things that we're extracting is very complex in terms of schema and ontology. And also the, the data is not always straight in the text. Sometimes it's fully structured in tables, sometimes it's semi, so there's some layout information, and sometimes it's literally just in the text. Uh, and kind of like a very simple example is if we want to extract something like the term of a contract, you have an example here where uh, we want to tell if this contract is just auto renewing or if it's fixed term. Fixed term means that it will uh, end after a certain amount of time. Uh, and this can be written in so many ways. I have some examples on the right of the screen, but if you look at it and you kind of look at enough examples, you'll find out that this is not a trivial pattern matching problem. Sometimes it requires understanding things that are across different, completely different parts of the contract even. And sometimes the text just doesn't even appear verbatim, but it's very implicit and requires some semantic meaning. Uh, next, I want to kind of like talk at a very high level about a typical document understanding pipeline. Uh, I'm not going to deep dive too deep into the details, but usually it starts with some sort of OCR, which outputs a lot of artifacts, outputs the text, it outputs some layout information, styling, some, uh, and a lot of structured data from tables, et cetera. And then we do a lot with this. So in, in, in this middle portion, we do things like segmentation and enrichment, and we change really the representation of the text so it's more suitable for downstream tasks. And at the very end, there's usually a bunch of NLP tasks, things that most people here are familiar with, like entity extraction, all sorts of classification, multi-label, multi-class, single-label, binary, et cetera, relationship extraction. And we just apply all, some business logic on top of these things to extract to kind of get the actual thing that the user wants which you can see in kind of like a contrived example on the far right. And my key takeaway from this pipeline is just to realize that every single node in this graph is a model. And Lexion, in Lexion, we have hundreds of these. 
Uh, and each one of them comes with all of the complexity that I'm gonna speak about today. Um, I'm gonna start by focusing my talk into like two kind of tracks. One of what are the goals that you would have in the very early stages of uh, starting a new uh, machine learning product, machine learning based product, and what kind of questions you have then. And then what do you do really more at steady state after you have reached the MVP, uh, validated, like had product market fit, validated demand, and kind of like what are the concerns at that stage. So at the beginning, you really have three questions. First, the most critical one is, is it feasible? Like, can we actually build it? And then is it, will people find it useful if we put it in their hands, which really translates to, can we charge them money? Uh, and the third one is, can we get there fast enough? A lot of problems, as Diego said, like are solvable if you're in academia and have years and years, but startups don't have that luxury. So really in this early stage, you're looking for tools that are super easy to understand and set up and deploy, but very low cost. Think kind of like Python scripts, Jupyter notebooks, uh, very simple REST APIs, et cetera. Later on, uh, when you're kind of, kind of like have users and you're kind of scaling the system, now your concerns shift into how do I scale this model development? How can I run so many more experiments and shift every bit, like uh, get every bit of ex uh, accuracy out of it? And how do I manage instead of just like the first five models that I started with, now I have hundreds, how do I scale that? How do I deploy all these things to production in a way that kind of doesn't take forever and is very prohibitively expensive? And also there becomes a new constraint where you can't use break user experience. So you can't just change the model in a way that makes users confused or gives them predictions. Even if they are better predictions, they might not be what they want. So at that phase, uh, the tools that you seem to pick up are, uh, that we kind of choose are more about how you do integrate it with your existing systems, with a more a bigger software system, because at the end of the day, you have to deliver that to user. How do you configure it to your use case? Because machine learning is very versatile and most of the tools are mostly very generic and you have to really tailor them for your use case. And then how do you scale that? Uh, this is a chart that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. Uh, it, it kind of appears in, in a lot of modes. Uh, as I said, like I've, I've had experience uh, and, and I was fortunate to kind of work this in an academic setting as well as in big companies like Microsoft and now in a startup. A lot of these things are similar between them. There are sh things that shift a little bit. Like for example, in, in academic, in academic setting, you were not worried as much about monitoring, but really want to get the best accuracy. And in big company, you really worry about scale from day zero. When in a startup, you really worried about like business viability and how to get there quickly. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna now dive into each one of these steps and how kind of like the thinking of tooling shifts uh, in the earlier days of a company and in the later days. So let's start with data. In the early days, uh, it's really hard for startups to get good training data. You have to be very creative. Usually you use a lot of scrapers. In our case, we really did literal FOIA requests to the government to get some real data. Uh, and because it's not like real customer data, it's just the closest we could get. We had to inv invest a lot in cleaning it up using some like scripts and rules. For example, the data we had was redacted heavily, which is not what actual data looks like. So we had to make it look more real. And we didn't have a, a lot of data, so it was easy for us to pick one of the off-the-shelf uh, annotation tools, like Explosion has a bunch of tools. There's a lot of uh, annotation tools for NLP in general that work okay at that, at that scale. But later on, now that we have customers and we have real data, the problem becomes more about managing all this data. It, it's, the, the scale is huge. You can't really run the experiments really uh, in, in this kind of ad hoc environment anymore. And you now have to pr protect the data. This is very sensitive data, especially in legal, uh, the legal space. You have to control who access it, who can kind of like run experiments on it and how, what piece of information you need to hide. And I wanna say, I wanna highlight like the last one is the biggest one. It's when you have this level of data scale, annotating things like one document or one bit at a time doesn't work anymore. It's very expensive, unless you're, you're like a very big company and willing to spend millions on hiring mTurkers to do it and all the machinery, you would have to shift into what we did kind of, which is really defer into uh, to an unsupervised and weakly supervised methods. And unfortunately there wasn't a lot on the market that we could use, so we had to build a lot in-house. Uh, if you're interested in that space, I mean, Snorkel out of Stanford and some of these are kind of addressing the same problem. Now I'm gonna shift into training. Uh, so in the early stage, the core difference is in the early stage, you really want to get uh, optimized for speed of results. You wanna get as uh, fast as you could to the result because you, you just really don't know if it's gonna work. I mean, you're seeing this data for the first time. You, at this stage, it's fine to kind of like just train everything in Jupyter and just like log the loss and, and be done with it. But later on, and now that, uh, at your advanced stage and building a lot more models, 
you really want to be able to experiment very fast and have a lot more models and get every model to its best state. This is the point where you need to start investing in frameworks, more sophisticated frameworks. This is when you pull in your like TensorBoard and Comet ML and Keras and PyTorch and all these things and, and, and take advantage of them. And your goal here is really to make your models the best models, especially if your business is uh, built upon the fact that you have the best possible AI. Uh, the next step is really about how do you package the model? And yeah, Diego said this perfectly. Like in the early day, literally, you just package your model in a Docker container, put it in a Flask server behind an endpoint and you just ship it. That's if it's real time, which is our case. If you're offline, it's pretty much the same, but you put it in a batch script that runs on like cron, some cron schedule. Uh, this doesn't work as well uh, at large scale where you're really worried about how do you operationalize this model? How, like every model has a lot of artifacts that you need to version and there's a lot of dependencies. There's a lot of cost. Uh, you, that you can kind of like, if you're not careful, you can end up with huge AWS builds. So you really have to be careful. And this is kind of like when you start using, looking at tools like really like Algorithmia and kind of like this tooling uh, to help you with that stuff. And I'm gonna dive a little deeper into this later in my talk. Uh, and then I wanna speak a little bit about how you validate models. Uh, this is, I, I think most people here kind of like go through this process, but in the early days, you just like measure like F1 precision, accuracy, just very high level metrics, usually like across the model, maybe you ate it by kind of like classes or by whatever the thing you're looking for, but you don't really care very much about the details. You're just happy that, oh, I have, I have like a pretty good F1, this works. But eventually when you have, uh, when you're at the advanced stages, you really want to understand like, is it really better and on which dimensions? Like, did you, did you work better for certain labels, but not as much for others? Uh, and, and why did it work really? Like you have to have really insight into what exactly is working so that you can do more of it and what isn't. And you have to be like evaluating how is it better? Like is, what's the end result on the user experience? This is the point where you have to start applying much more rigor that you usually don't even have in the early stages. So you start investing like in validation sets that are like at every step of this graph. And then you also need to have very good end-to-end -end tests that measure everything orchestrated together in conjunction, really measuring what the user will actually see. Uh, and you have to have a lot more detailed metrics. Like I remember in the early days, as I said, we just have the metrics on the left, but now we have very deep metrics into kind of like every single bit of the thing the model predicts. Um, how do we measure, how do we kind of make sure that we really understand what's going on. So instead of like for the entity task, instead of like having metrics on like DIO tags, we really have it like literally on each entity type. For multi-labels, like we dive into metrics on every single label in the labels, et cetera, instead of looking at macro and micro averages. Uh, and then we come to deployment. Uh, again, in, in the very early day, just take this, the Flask application step forward, just throw it in a Docker container, put it on EC2, you're done. It works, you can kind of like, demo it to customers, you can demo it to investors, and it works. But when it comes for serious time, that doesn't work as well. Uh, first, you can't really optimize your inference time. So you can, your, your queries might take very long, too much for, for the system to be useful. Uh, also, you start running into more like sophisticated operation, operation issues. Like if you have like one big customer who uploads like 10,000 documents, they might make the whole, either break the system, or if you're lucky, to just starve the system. So any customer that comes at this time can't use it anymore because you don't have like elasticity and uh, you can't automatically kind of like give some uh, room for other jobs to run and things like that. And also when you start uh, running at that scale, you need to be able to quickly get the right version of the model quickly to all machines. Uh, so you have to have a mechanism to deploy hotfixes to your models, especially if things start breaking or you get an alert. You can't kind of like wait for somebody to get the right Docker image on the right machine and restart it basically. Uh, and the final step, which is uh, usually uh, glossed over by most people, especially in the early days, is how do you monitor? Uh, in the very early days, you just do enough to not embarrass yourself in front of customers. Usually this translates into a very high level end-to-end -end alert that just like gives you like a smoke test. Like are things generally working or are they completely broken? That just doesn't work at all later because when you get this alert, you have no idea what's broken. Like we've changed 20 things just today. We've updated the OCR version. We've updated the PyTorch library. Somebody has like, uh, the annotation team has like completely added a bunch of new labels and we, somebody retrained and we don't know if which model is impacted. So at that level, you really will have to have much more detailed KPI for every node in the graph. And you're going to closely monitor things like model drift 
and also have some, it's important to have some end-to-end -end, uh, user satisfaction metrics. Whether you really uh, have some support channel where you can kind of like gauge user, uh, user feelings, or if you can kind of even automate this a little bit, uh, it, would be work, it would work great. For our case, like we have some uh, watchdogs, we call them, that would just upload real looking customer data and uh, we would look into how well we're doing on these and we would get alerted if things are broken. And this is the stage where you start investing in logging, like the data dogs of the world, a lot more dashboards for every component so that you can quickly pin which part is broken and a lot of alerting so that your uh, DevOps team is not constantly watching, uh, but no kind of like have capacity to work on improving the infrastructure versus constantly uh, monitoring the system. So this is the very high level stuff. Uh, I picked a per, an area, a very small slice of all this uh, to really dive deep into it because I know the, the audience is fairly technical uh, and I'm, I'm passionate about it, it's top of mind for me and it's really one of the areas that we spend a lot of time uh, spent and are continuously spending. And this is really model versioning or uh, model management if you will. Uh, so let me first start by what are the problems that manifest themselves or kind of like what are real questions we had to answer in order to know we have a versioning problem. One typical question is we used to predict the right value for attribute X on this document and all of a sudden it's not working anymore. We're predicting the wrong value. We have no, without proper versioning, we have no idea what happened. Wh which part, which node in this uh, pipeline broke? Is it a software bug? Is it a model bug? Is it a dependency that we changed? You have no idea to tell. And usually you know this either by an alert firing or worse, a user complains and tells you, hey, this doesn't make sense at all. Uh, this is something you really want to avoid. Another problem is uh, you're training a new model or, or retraining a model that you had. It's very common for us to kind of like have a model that's good enough, suffer from some model drift, and now we need to retrain it on some new data but we're not able to reproduce the good results. Like no matter what we do, we're trying as much as possible to use all the same parameters. Uh, we, get, we try to get back to the same architecture, but it, we're just not able to get the same metrics again. What happened and how do we roll back? We have changed the code so much, we don't even know what it was. Uh, and usually this is kind of, uh, you feel this from a product manager or a quality engineer who is not able to ship the thing to the user who needs it, because if we ship it, we're actually we're gonna regress for all customers. Um, and a third one is one that I hear a lot and I suffer from personally, which is I run a, friend, I ran a few experiments. Uh, everything was great. I didn't change anything. I'm running the exact same experiment or I think is the exact same experiment and I'm not getting the same results. They're much worse now. And I can like swear that everything is exactly the same, but no matter how hard I try, it's not working. And this is usually like a complaint from the data science team, a complaint from the data science team. And that's what they would ask the infrastructure team to help them with. Uh, before I kind of like move forward into how we can fix these issues, I want to stop and tell you, you really need to invest in being able to reproduce your model results very rigorously. You have to be able to train the model a hundred times and get the same results to the 10th decimal place. And if it's, if you couldn't do that, it's really not worth doing any of that, what I'm going to dive into because you just don't know, you don't have a baseline. You, you can't tell if versioning is even working at all. And really this is not as a trivial thing, getting the same results because all these frameworks we use, PyTorch, uh, Scikit-Learn, and NL like NLTK, they all have a lot of like pseudo random gen number generators built in. And you have to remember to seed everything, seed everything in the Python application, really think about like, are these uh, seeds really across the thread or the process or the host? Some of them are really environment variables at the Linux level. Like what happens if two experiments are running at the same time? It's a harder problem than it seems. And some of them are very subtle. Like I remember I spent like half a day debugging an issue, which was because somebody on the team switched the label set from a list to a hash set in Python. And set Python just because it's an unordered set, they're taking it really very literally and they just give you a different order every time. So now because of this shift, the model was not giving us the same results. Things like that. So you have to always be sure to be able to get this right and test it every once in a while to make sure you didn't lose it. Uh, the first question I get before when I talk about this topic is, hey, what's new? I mean, software engineers have been versioning their code for decades. Uh, why, why are we even talking about this? Uh, so I agree, yes, software engineers have invest, invented like source control and, and made a lot of amazing tool. And yes, good software teams and companies are very good at versioning their code and dependencies and config and even their deployment topology. 
Uh, but in the context of ML, code is a lot more than just the application source code. Code is a lot of things. It's your data preparation pre-processing scripts. It's every library that you depend on that sometimes like come with the EC2 instance or you install manually. It's the model code itself, like your neural network architecture is the featureizer code. And it includes a lot more. It includes things like all of your training data. This includes the data and the labels. It includes all your training parameters. Like when did you decide to stop? Did you use patience? Did you use early stopping? Uh, of course, what is the model state? Like you need to store all the weights, all the hyperparameters, the things that will allow you to rehydrate the model and, and run inference on it. And even the hardware has implications. Uh, it's very subtle, but sometimes changing a hardware architecture would actually have impact on the actual values because of floating point uh, or arithmetic uh, changes in the processor or the GPU. So it's a lot more complicated is really the point uh, that I'm trying to bring and it's closed very quickly. Uh, so, okay, what really is versioning then for ML models? Uh, there's various levels. The weakest level, and this is where usually people usually start, is I'm just gonna have like a good stable model. I'm gonna call it the production model. And I'm gonna have like N staging models, like the newer ones. And whenever I'm ready, I feel that this, one of the staging models is good, I'm just gonna promote it to prod. And that works okay. It allows you to kind of like have a very short roll back, roll forward window. Usually this is like hours or days if you're like a slow team. But basically once you introduce a breaking change into your code base, you can't roll back anymore. Your whatever was on your production doesn't have the right shape of data. So it works, it's better than nothing, but it's very short term and, and shouldn't live long. The second level, it's a little stronger. Uh, it's basically being able to reproduce the inference uh, of a model. So you can go back to any point in time to a specific version of a model, run the same input and get exactly the same output and the same scores. And this kind of like is a generalization of the weaker one, but instead of having like two slots, you have like an infinite number of slots in time. And you can like go back to like the model that was working in March 2nd uh, for like this specific model type with confidence. And it should be really easy to do that. It shouldn't be a lot of manual work. Like you shouldn't be doing database building and kind of like downloading files and stitching them together. This should be like really ideally like a one click thing. Uh, and then the strongest level of versioning is uh, reproducing training. This is uh, kind of like the strongest uh, tool in your tool chain as a like versioning machine learning engineer. This allows you to really recreate the model uh, exactly like it was back from the training data. So for this to work, you need everything in uh, reproducing inference, but you also need to have very uh, well versioned training data and labels. Uh, and, the, and, and even the training, hyper, the training per configuration itself, like how many, how, many kind of, how many iterations or epochs you were running for, et cetera. Uh, and this really protects you from things that are very hard to recover from. Like if you lost some training data or even worse, if you, hi like some, you hired somebody who's doing some weak annotation technique and some of the labels are just bad. And now they're, you can't tell which are good and which are bad and you're stuck. You can't train anymore till you clean up your training data. Uh, this is the fix for that. Uh, so I'm gonna like talk a little bit about like which artifacts do you need to version in the two. I'm, I'm gonna ignore production and staging. It's just kind of like a toy thing. But for inference and training, you would need to version these things. You have to definitely version your hyperparameters. All of your featureizer code uh, has to be versioned. Uh, even if you kind of like, w you have to be very uh, diligent about this because very subtle changes in the code structure might have serious implications like you might like just order some with like function calls within your featureizer but it might have a uh, material impact vocab for example in nlp is an example of featureizer data a lot of people don't think about this like in nlp it's very common to remove stop words but do you ever stop and think that maybe you if you upgrade upgrade the nltk library version they might have added or removed a new stop word and now all your features meaning have shifted a little bit so you have to kind of like think about all the featureizer data of course, the model code itself, like whatever a technique you're using, and an example is like your neural network architecture itself. How many layers? What's that? What like activation are you using? Uh, the model config, like sometimes you want to enable and disable some features. The model state is kind of trivial. Uh, all your library dependencies, your hardware version that you ran on, and finally uh, the training config and the training data that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these last two are only required if you're doing applying the strictest version of uh, versioning, which is uh, training versioning. So now I'm going to go back to that pipeline that I spoke about earlier and just want you to imagine that what I said applies to every single one of this. So if you have 100 models here, you have to version the artifact for each one of these. And that's a lot of things. So it's not a trivial problem. 
uh, some sort of solutions that don't really work and that I hear. Uh, so for example, a lot of people tell me, you know what, let's just snap it and like shove it in a Docker image and we can store it forever in S3. And whenever we want to go back, let's just run this. Sure, I mean, that's the equivalent of putting your source control, the source code on like a flash drive and storing it in the drawer and saying, whenever we have a bug in that model, I'm just gonna get it from the flash drive. But like, how do you keep this up to date? How do you merge it with like later version of the code? And how do you hot fix it? Uh, another one that doesn't work is, it's kind of like, uh, really goes down to the production staging slots thing, which is, I'm really gonna have like a stable version and I'm, I'm not gonna update uh, unless it's tested. But yeah, if you do that, you're kind of stuck because you're too scared to make any breaking changes because then you lose the ability to roll back. So it's unrecommended. Uh, another one that people say a lot, it's, uh, you know what? The versioning is just too hard. We're not gonna do it. We're just gonna be really, really sure that the model, like the model that we commit in master is right. So we don't really have to roll back. We're gonna completely be smart and avoid the problem. And I mean, first of all, this never worked for software in general, but second, like if you do that, you lose one of your most powerful uh, advantages as a startup, you can't move quickly anymore. You're kind of like too scared to kind of like deploy anything because it just can break things and you have no uh, way out. So we evaluated a lot of solutions uh, to kind of like pick. Uh, these are some of the ones we looked at. Uh, a lot of them have, they overlap a lot in tooling uh, in terms of features. Uh, Metaflow is what we ended up kind of like picking because it has a lot of the features and it's really easy to integrate with our existing system. This was kind of like my question, uh, the root behind my question for uh, Diego is, there's always a very big cost and usually in changing machine learning infrastructure. And I'm very happy to kind of like hear that Algorithmia has figured this out. It hasn't been as smooth for us whenever we change part of our tool chain. So hearing this is very refreshing. Uh, and there is, it is a lot of work too. That's, that's what has been my experience when, uh, if, unless the tool was redesigned for it, it's hard. And it's really hard to do this as a startup. Uh, you have to be very smart on deciding when do you address a problem. Uh, as at the end of the day, our job as a startup is not to do the best ML, it's to sell, create a business that is desirable and that we can grow. Uh, so really uh, you have to pick the right time and, 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 and be sure to uh, prolong whatever you have as much as possible. So in our case, for example, we didn't go straight to like more, more of the sophisticated tools. We had a lot of like small patches that kind of like carried us through for a long time. They just stopped working after a while which is for, we started like putting all the model state, like the weights and hyperparameters and everything as part of like one uh, zip archive that we can then rehydrate. This to give us some, some time. We started versioning all our artifacts and decided to make them immutable. So we can kind of like go back to a specific version of data and retrain. Uh, we start, they started kind of like structuring the code uh, or the way we kind of like uh, integrate our models, all these nodes in the graph to have very stable interfaces and then whenever we want to make a breaking change into a model or a piece or a node, we basically just would copy it and make the change and give it a version name and put it as part of the model config. So now we have kind of like all the different versions and can easily so go back and forth. Uh, and finally, you have to make some calls on things you will decide to uh, remove as a dimension, as a version dimension. If you decide to really version every single thing, it just becomes very expensive. So in our case, like some things we can kind of like live with without changing for a long time. Like for example, the hardware, let's just stick to it. Yes, we need to understand which version, but we're not, we don't have to change it every quarter. Same for like some very stable libraries that we use. It's gonna be so expensive to be able to kind of like change this because the data formats change, et cetera. So we pin as much as you could and make this decision carefully because then if there's a bug, it's hard to kind of like recover from that. Uh, and uh, just remember that really, a company like Lexion, we're not building machine learning infrastructure. We are building an application that uses machine learning. So uh, we really have to take this into account while picking our investments, uh, because at the end of the day, we, we still need to add a lot of features. For example, like, yes, we have the ML, it's a big part of our platform, but really we have to build all these features around it. Things that like our customers need, APIs, permissions, authentication, text search, permissioning, dashboards, reporting, all this is in addition to all the machine learning work. So we can, we don't have the luxury to invest a lot. So we have to be very pragmatic in, in the tooling that we invest in. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna end with a very quick note on just technical debt in general from my observations, both at, it applied really at Microsoft and, and here and even in academia, which is you have, this comes, this is easier said than done and it comes with a lot of experience, uh, but there's a lot of like material online and, and I'm happy to point you to some articles that helped me a lot with this. The paper that, uh, 
that Diego shared is incredible. Uh, it would definitely address that. Uh, but identify when the cost of having all this machine learning tech debt is higher than addressing it. At some point, your data scientist will not be able to run experiments anymore. And now you have like very, uh, very sophisticated folks that are very highly paid sitting doing nothing. This is definitely very expensive. So this is kind of a thing. Or at some point, your system will keep breaking so often and you can't fix it where you're going to start losing customers. So keeping track of like the right time is very critical. Also, this is some, something, this is really, again, to, to Diego's point, like machine learning is not machine learning in production. I cannot agree more on this sentence. Uh, people like get very excited when they have a working model and they decide to ship it, but they don't take into account that really shipping a machine learning model in production is expensive. And if it's not accounted for in the business model, you can end up be with an unviable business model because just you, you, you can't invest enough to get it working. Uh, and yeah, be very careful about the kind of technical debt. Not all technical debt is equal. Every time you make a technical debt decision, you have to make it consciously and have a plan. And we try to really apply this when in our design discussions, when we're building something new, we always try to answer the question of, okay, let's, let's assume we're gonna live with this shortcut or hack. What's the story six months from now? And if we don't, can't convince ourselves for real that we have a plan that's gonna work, we, don't, we then invest upfront. Uh, which brings me to the point is model versioning is, and, and model management is one of the areas are very hard to recover from. Uh, so maybe, maybe don't do it on day zero, but don't postpone it too much. Uh, use a tool that can help you or, or plan for using a tool early on, or you're going to be uh, uh, in a lot of pain very quickly. And finally, keep in mind that like, yeah, this great model and this excitement, having like getting pushing an F1 score from 0 0.93 to 4 is very exciting. But if, if it doesn't translate into something your customer really loves, and even if you have the best machine learning tooling and infrastructure, it's all like not gonna take you uh, anywhere. So always keep that in mind. And that's all, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, em Ahmad, this is really incredible. Uh, don't be shy, please uh, feel free to unmute or post questions uh, into the chat just like before. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Question. So, in, in the um, just given the space and the sensitivity of legal docs, have you? And I realize it's early on, but like, have you have you been pushed about you know because you're offering today as a SaaS product, right? And all of this kind of like which which again adds a, a different level. You know, it reduces complexity when you can run it all in house. Like, have you been pushed towards like we are, you know our docs are the most you know the sensitive docs ever you need to train in our vpc and we're not going to send you the docs and we can't work with it or have you been able to avoid that it's it has been a problem uh, rarely not very common i think people customers in general especially enterprise customers are finally opening up to the concept that the future is the cloud and they will have to really be open to it so they shifted their question to more about how are you, how secure are you what kind of certification do you have tell us about your process answer this 300 question questionnaire versus like no it has to Fortunately, it's not like it has to be on-prem or we're out, uh, which I heard was the case like five years ago. So I'm, I'm glad it's not the case. So we had to invest so much in security to kind of like pass these security audits, but uh, it hasn't been a blocker. Got it. Uh, there's a question says, uh, at GE Search, working for the GE Energy Business Contract Lawyers, we solved this problem using NLP plus ontology inference. It's cool. This looks like an interesting piece of work. Uh, the biggest challenge we had to consider was the lawyers, the user had to believe 100% that no critical clause was missed. Otherwise, they still had to review the contract. Yep. Got it. Uh, so yes, a recall is very critical for our customers. They don't want to miss anything, uh, especially lawyers. They're very skeptical by nature. Unfortunately, this is like a, a problem in machine learning in general. It's hard to prove that you didn't miss something because if you didn't get it, how do you tell if it really wasn't there or not? It's a much, much easier to pull the thing and then verify it versus prove that it was really absent. And this is something that we had to invest a lot. The short term, the short answer to the solution is we, we didn't fully solve it, but we gave, we, by automation, but we gave our customers a lot of tooling that allow, allows them to build this trust. So when we miss something, we point them to all the relevant language in general in the contract so they can read for themselves. And they can tell like, this is all the language that could possibly show up in a contract and talk about this. If it really didn't mention it, then it's not there. So we kind of fixed it by giving them tooling to kind of build this trust. And our experience that after they start like seeing that we're correctly getting all the uh, true negatives, 
they start kind of like getting going uh, get, getting that trust and not worrying about it too much. Uh, but yeah, it's a serious problem, and uh, I think it's a problem in general for any high recall requirement environment. Um, and we also give them a lot of very strong full text search. In in theory, our technology should allow really makes full text search not very relevant because we should just give you the structured data. But we had to build very good full text search so that they can run a complicated query and really convince themselves. So things like proximity search and like Boolean operators, things that will allow a lawyer to really convince themselves that the language is not there. Can I uh, jump in on that question? Um, Absolutely. So one of the things that we've been struggling with is uh, the fact that our, we don't really know how to test, right, problem, test our models and also explain to like our non-technical stakeholders that models are probabilistic. So like as you train it with more data, especially in the LP space, you're predictions will, you know, will, will flow or they'll kind of start drifting towards kind of other, uh, especially if you're doing like multi-class labels, they'll drift towards things that are maybe overlapping or similar. Uh, and so we've been trying to figure out like, how do we both consistently have a good testing framework to like ensure performance? Because sometimes aggregate level statistics aren't a good measure when you have people who are going in and doing like, you know, single example queries and those things are breaking. And at the same time, we don't want to have those things be memorized because that's not a good model. So we haven't really figured out the right way to like test our, our models and have a good testing framework in place. This is unfortunately an area that is lacking in open source. Like, I mean, if you look at all the people usually use like one of scikit-learn's uh, performance and metrics things, but they don't really do a good job there. We had to build our own uh, our own tooling there for ver this very very uh, same reason. Like, if you look at like all the most of the available tooling will give you you can pick like some weighting thing, so micro or macro or or things like that. But if you want to look at a single label at a time. We, it's not a lot of code, but we had to kind of like invest in kind of like getting the metrics per label. Yeah, it's not so much as a single label, it, more so the issue that your individual point uh, predictions might vary if you add in, you know, new vocabulary or new examples to your training set. So like, say you have a multi-class problem, you have two uh, classes that are very similar. As you add in more data, more training data, um, sometimes they might converge or they might, uh, you might have, you know, your intents kind of drifting apart. And part of it is you probably want to do a better job of separating out your training examples and your, your classes. but. The other part of it is just by my nature of like, you know, working with uh, NLP, adding more vocabulary will cause your, your model to kind of drift in different ways that are unpredictable. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes the decision boundary just gets lost as you add more data. So you kind of like either add, need to add more features or you, you have to kind of like label a lot more data that are discriminative uh, in both classes, especially in the case where the classes are very different. In here, we started by doing a lot of, uh, in the early days, we were doing like a lot of manual feature engineering to kind of like discriminate these similar classes. So yes, we have to detect it first and we would kind of like track when the user changes the results. So now we can know when we got something wrong and then we find out that it was two very similar classes, but this didn't scale well. So what we do now is we keep an eye on model drift in general and we ha use a weekly supervised technique that allows us without doing feature engineering to kind of like label a lot of data from these specific classes. And you can use like techniques like active learning where basically the model will tell you itself which are the examples it's getting confused on. Uh, and basically recommend for the data scientist or annotator, you know what, these two are, on, on the, are, are very close to the decision boundary, they cross a lot. So it, you will gain a lot more value from just annotating these examples versus just going and randomly picking from the, from the data set space. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the challenge was more so just like, how do we set up repeatable tests um, when your tests are not reliable? Uh, maybe let me ask you, why are they not reliable? Like in our case, basically we have a, a very big data set that we run daily and we can kind of like get exactly what are the failures. So, and, and we built a bunch of code. Is this kind of the missing component? Well, yeah, so ours is the opposite issue. We don't have a big, big data set, right? So we have um, a small data set that, that fluctuates as we have more training data. Oh, I see. Uh, it's very hard to solve like this kind of problem yeah. with real data. Yeah, this is really a data issue. My advice would be get more data before you invest anymore uh, because you can get, drive yourself crazy trying to get it to work. And this might not, not, does not necessarily translate to go get more data. Sometimes it's just data augmentation, make like simple changes, find the ones that the model are confusing in upscale, uh, sorry, upsample, the ones that are, if you don't have it enough, but like a certain subset, just up, upsample them so that the model kind of sees them more often. Tricks like that. Uh, I want to go back to the question I had. There was a follow-up after, uh, which is, does it go beyond accuracy to more user in the loop or the progression of model accuracy is visible? 
uh, we internally show the, the uh, keep track of the improvement of model accuracy. We don't expose it to the user just because it's hard for end our end users to interpret these accuracy. Even scores, like scores are not calibrated across models. So if we show it to them, they won't really gain much. Uh, but we do kind of like allow them to verify things and to fix things. And we very accurately keep track of that and push it back into our training system so that we can improve the model in these cases. Uh, moving on to Andy's question. Uh, old version inquiry. No, Metaflow addresses the majority of it, but not everything. Metaflow is really good at versioning the DAG and like the actual code itself. It didn't fit very well uh, for the data versioning aspect of things just because the size of the data, PDF documents are just huge. And if you, if we actually want to also version the OCR output, which is like an average like 30 megabytes. So we were not able to use that. We have a custom solution, but the rest of it translates itself very well with, uh, to lends itself very well to Metaflow. I might see Shane on the video. I had a quick question. Um, so, uh, you know, it's great that you're building a, a, an AI powered business. Um, you know, what I find really interesting is uh, sort of in the NLP field, we're kind of having this Alex Ned moment the last couple of years with all these great breakthroughs. Um, so I'm really curious to know that given that you created this startup, um, you know, they talk about building a moat or a defensibility, like what makes your startup very, you know, competitively very differentiated from others. Um, you know, given the fact that there's, um, you know, there's so many great models that are being open source right now, obviously we started with, you know, with great transformer models uh, and we keep building more and more and they get open source, a lot of them, um, which is great. It's a double-edged sword though, right? Um, so I'm just curious to know for someone like you who's building a, an AI first business, um, you know, what do you see as your moat? Like, how, how do you build defensibility? Um, you know, knowing that, you know, all these great algorithms, they keep, you know, uh, improving on their performance benchmarks and they keep beating all these benchmarks. You know, it's hard to even keep track, right? Like every, every two weeks, every month, uh, someone's beating someone else's benchmark, right? And, 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 the, and the code is being open sourced. Um, I'm just curious to know from a business perspective as you're building out Lexion, uh, how do you think about that? Like, how, how do you think about building a, a, a defensible mode that uh, keeps you always, you know, ahead of the ahead of competitors? That's a very good question, and it's a question I'm sure we're going to get asked by investors in every round we raise. Uh, and I, I, I do have a, an answer for it. Uh, there are two aspects of the machine learning models we build that are very defensible uh, and hard to replicate. So yes, there are like the puppet papers and the libraries that like Hugging Face and Spacey did lower the barrier of entry for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, working in documents is uh, not a lot of people, not a lot of these technologies really work well with documents. I mean, BERT has a maximum token length of like 512, which is like less than 1% of our average document length. So a lot of these tools didn't really catch up into the field of document understanding. Not to say that eventually they will, but we had to invest so much in getting these uh, libraries to work uh, for us uh, by uh, investing in kind of like really changing the model architecture to work with documents. This is one big part of it. The second big part is just understanding the domain has a lot of value. So even if you have the best like entity extractors and classifiers and relationship extractor that's using the, the latest Muppet uh, paper for everything. Yeah, have you read? Sorry, I'm just talking to my son here. <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, so uh, if we kind of like are using the latest Muppet paper and getting like good results on every one of these, we still need to stitch it all together. So uh, understanding like what's the right schema, these schemas are very nested, requires a lot of thinking and even modeling it. Like you have a schema, it's like a three level JSON with a lot of business logic. What do you represent as a class versus an entity versus a relation versus an entity linking? And it takes a lot of, uh, of effort and time to kind of like build this domain expertise that I think is very hard to replicate. Uh, is this convincing or I'm, I'm happy to get, I'd love to be challenged. Yeah, yeah. Better you than no, no, de de definitely. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, in my experience also, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head. I think um, getting that, that, that domain expertise is, um, you know, is, is one of the, is one of the elements, one of the ingredients in the secret sauce, right? I think the technical competency obviously has to be there. Um, but um, if you don't apply it in the right way and, and, and one way to do that is, is to build up your team and, and, and the knowledge of the domain. Right. Um, also the infrastructure, like piping, plugging all these things to work end to end is very hard. Even if yeah. like you have the best OCR and the best entity structure, getting it to work is non-trivial. No and in addition, uh, in addition to that, uh, sorry, what was it? Oh yeah. Uh, if, if, if you have, uh, sorry, just one second. I'm just going to help my daughter. 
backing. <laughs> yeah, just one second here. Right. Really multitasking here, Ahmad. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, eventually, eventually. Uh, I'm back, sorry. He just is very excited and doesn't want to leave. So uh, what I was uh, just going to add to this is, uh, in addition to the domain expertise, a lot of the NLP problems here are not only NLP, so a lot of it's computer vision because a lot of the data shows in contracts in tables and we really utilize a lot of, uh, of the styling information, bolding, italics, underlining, like when paragraphs start and end, headers, footers. And I think we're one of the very early people to kind of like merge computer vision and NLP in that way. There's definitely some research groups working on it, but definitely not in industry yet. Is the CV part on the OCR part and the initial part of the pipeline? Correct. For the ingestion, okay. If, if I can take a stab at, uh, at your answering and that question from a completely, totally different angle. And so we're, a, we're, we're users of Lexion, so we're customers. Uh, I mean, I actually don't care uh, about the technology and how he advances. The fact that like, it's saving me hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, uh, you know, the technology, the fact that it just works, right? And so like, I actually, from my perspective, and go to the defensibility, as long as my legal team can work with it, get the contracts done, move faster, and I'm not paying my extreme, more expensive lawyer uh, to be able to do this, like, I don't, like, it doesn't actually really matter about, like, the, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they are, you know, I'm hearing this and they're going for, you know, as a technologist, they care about it, but, like, I think the defensibility actually comes in and, like, what you're actually saving from a business result, uh, which is, I'm saving a ton of money. Seriously, like, none, none of our customers care about the AI at all. They just want the problem solved. They don't care if we literally like have drones like doing it manually, it, they, they'd be happy. They just want the problem solved. Uh, the, the, the fact that we can kind of like understand their problem and solve it is really a very critical part of it. I think interesting to echo a Daniel's note who, who just posted into the chat. Uh, data shows that not that many companies get it to a scale that Ahmad was able to get it. Uh, so, you know, you can build, and Diego's talk gave a lot of great uh, survey data on stats of how to move from POC to actually running it at scale. Uh, so I think both of these talks really kind of demonstrate on real world examples how hard it is to just chase all of this ever evolving technology that, that moves accuracy by a little bit, but in reality, there's so much to build out to get it working. Uh, well, there's one more question I see. Uh, quick question. How transferable is your technology to other domains, legal docs and other domains? Fairly transferable. So everything I said about getting the technology to work well on documents, it, this part of the, is, is transferable. The domain expertise part takes a while. We have built, we have built a good uh, skill set of being good at building the skill set. <laughs> so kind of we learned how to learn. So we can kind of like really when we get a new set of documents from a very different domain, like some, some customers sent us a bunch of titles, uh, like real estate titles or like some insurance documents, we know what to look for. We can like looking at just like a handful of examples, tell immediately what's gonna be a problem, what isn't. And we're very upfront with the customers. We tell them, hey, the technology will work really well for these, but not for those. Uh, and we can very easily kind of like, we build the muscle to be able to go from a document to what's kind of the right way to model it in terms of like NLP tasks. Uh, but it's very transferable and it's definitely an area that we want to uh, expand in over time, getting into more domains.